Hi everybody, my name is Dr. B and today's topic is how to quit benzos, recommended benzo taper schedule. So let's get right into it. And today the question I want to answer that I have uh, sent to me here is how to quit benzos. And then there's some follow up questions with them, uh, with this question. And uh, this is a wonderful question. It's actually a topic that's very near and dear to me. Uh, but I want to reframe the question, how to quit benzos. That sort of assumes that anytime someone's on benzos uh, and benzodiazepines like Xanax, Clonopin, Valium, Temazepam, you need to quit them. So the first question to ask is, <clears throat> why do you need to quit benzos? And that needs a full assessment by a competent clinician. For example, you know, nowadays because Xanax is such a substance of extensive abuse and someone may be on it or someone hears that they're on it, it's like, oh my God, they're on benzodiazepines, they're on Xanax, you need to get off of that. That's not always necessarily true. This gives an opportunity to really explain the way these drugs are prescribed. I do believe, let's take Xanax for example, I do these, I believe these drugs are overprescribed. Why are they overprescribed? Uh, I think sometimes it's a frustration of the clinician on his side. Uh, and then a lot of it also has to do with cultural and individual attitudes towards these medications, what they can do for them, and the propensity to use a quick fix for a problem that needs a long-term solution, for example, therapy and other behavioral and cognitive modifications. So the first question to ask is, uh, why are we quitting benzos? And again, here I'm gonna try to uh, answer very generally, and there's nuances and differences and some things that might be out of the box. For example, if I have an adult male, let's say in his 50s, and he has a particular kind of tremor, or he really has a particular kind of generalized anxiety and he has been taking Xanax, 0.25 milligrams, once a day for the last 25 years. And he's stable on that dose and there's never been any evidence of abuse or increasing the dose or seeking the drug elsewhere. That's where the clinician should weigh out the risk versus the benefit of short-term and long-term effects on that, of that drug. So this is key. And uh, I would say the reason we have such an abuse potential, or rather we have such a disseminated, uh, um, uh, or let me put it this way, why we have really such an epidemic in my view of too many people on it at too high a dose is those things aren't evaluated appropriately and constantly for every patient. Because once you get on this medication, you can have some serious short-term and long-term withdrawal effects if you try to come off of it. So, you know, the first question is, why, do you, why is the patient on the benzodiazepines and should they get off of it? Once that's been settled, and again, there's nuances, and there's some people that may need to be on this medication long-term, including a lot of neurological chronic diseases uh, where these uh, patients may be bedridden or have mobility issues or tremors or need it as a muscle relaxant. There's another video where I cover a lot of these issues. So you really have to ask why that patient is on the benzos and is the dose appropriate and do they actually need to taper down to a lower dose? Once that question is answered, uh, you can say, okay, this guy needs to get off benzos. So who needs to get off benzos or who needs to lower their dose? Again, that's a question that you really need to evaluate closely. Is this a young person that is on a too high a dose, let's say two milligrams of Xanax twice a day, and he's 24 years old, and he's on it for anxiety, well, I think that dose is a little high, and over the long run, it's gonna have severe consequences, and what are you gonna do 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years from now? 
that dose really needs to be extensively reduced and or cut off and other means, it's behavioral interventions, behavioral therapies need to be uh, instituted so that this patient doesn't stay on that dose long enough. So that might be one type of patient. Another patient, and again, it's very hard to, uh, I wouldn't necessarily call that an addiction if they're staying on their dose, but it will have profound long-term effects. I would call that physiological dependence that maybe doesn't need to be there. Then there's the real addict who is taking benzos at large doses, any benzo they can get, and it's been escalating over a short or long period of time, well, that person definitely needs to be put on a taper. Or somebody else that you are certain needs to be on a lower dose and they need to taper that dose down. So the folks that need to be uh, on a benzo taper to either lower the dose or get them completely off also differs and you need a very close clinical evaluation to make that decision. Uh, the, the question within that is, uh, what are the dose, what are the risks involved with tapering uh, off of benzos? And I'm also asked, what is your recommended benzo taper schedule? And finally, how long does it take to get off benzos? I'm gonna combine all of those questions. The first one I will answer a little bit more directly and succinctly and the risks are quite a bit. Uh, benzos fall under the class of sedative hypnotic uh, medications, and it is the only class that you can have what's called severe morbidity and mortality. You can get very sick, including seizures, and uh, you can actually potentially die from coming off of benzos. This includes alcohol, which is the same class of drugs, barbiturates, which is the same class of drugs, uh, sedative hypnotics, Benzodiazepines fall under them. It's the only class of drugs that coming off of the wrong way can potentially get you very sick, including uh, seizures, and it could lead to death. Two, the withdrawals, whether you just cut them off or you're tapering the wrong way, are absolutely a monster. Uh, uh, for Again, there's variations with different people. Please keep that in mind. But you will get someone reporting that, hey, I've been off this stuff two years, three years, and I'm still having a lot of problems with this. Uh, I still have, they, they'll call it post-acute withdrawals, and I'm, I still, uh, with opiates, but they apply to benzos, I'm still having withdrawal issues, whether it's sleep, nervousness, some people will even see floaters, all kinds of things. So the withdrawal off of this stuff can not only be dangerous, uh, or coming off of it, uh, but it, it's very inhumane the way people come off of this stuff. And here's where we really get into uh, the question, uh, your recommended benzo taper schedule. And uh, this is uh, uh, really, really important to me. And this is where I think it's critical. I'm going to say this before I uh, get into the schedule that I use. I think the system, whether it's the insurance system or the medical community establishment, doesn't really support both the payment structure and the clinical attention needed to benzodiazepine withdrawals. What do I mean by this? If you go into a detox or rehab, or even if you go to your doctor, these withdrawals and tapers are done relatively rapidly, a lot more rapidly than should be done for most people that have a serious issue, whether it's an addiction issue or long-term use issue. Uh, uh, they're done much too rapidly. I mean, you might go into a 10-day, 20-day detox program to get you off of benzos and you've been abusing it for four years. And this can be very dangerous and very painful in the short and long term. I do it a little bit differently, and I think there's plenty of evidence, scientific evidence, to approach it in this way. When patients come to me with this issue, any of the types of patients that I see, whether it's straight up abuse and addiction, or someone who's been on it a long time, but needs to at least lower their dose, first thing you need to I do is, I build a really good trusting rapport with the patient because their first concern is withdrawals. 
and her first concern is getting her benzos. And it's very interesting when you watch these patients and you really get to know them, there is a fear in their eyes of getting their benzodiazepines taken away. And you really have to build that clinical trust because they truly feel that they desperately need this medication to make it day to day at the doses they are taking. And to a great extent, they are absolutely right. Uh, when you deal with them at the clinical level where there's just interaction, it's almost as if their anxiety receptors have been burned out. You'll see little tremors. You'll see this uh, contorted uh, face when they deal with you. And you see the fear and concern in their eyes. Uh, and so you have to really build a relationship, first of all, that I am not going to hurt you. I do know what I'm doing and I'm, you won't really feel the pain, and I won't let you get sick, and I won't let anything happen to you. I go over this because this is a crucial part of the benzodiazepine taper. The next thing I do, and sometimes this takes a day, but usually it could take me a few weeks, and depending on the patient underneath, if they're abusing it on the street, if they have been on it, I will continue to make an equivalency dose uh, prescription until we build this rapport. And I don't let it go too long. You don't want to do that because now you're supporting their habit if it's abuse and uh, addiction uh, and or you're continuing where they've been at, which you can uh, go on a little bit longer than if someone's buying on the street. But my main goal, first of all, is to be able to measure where they're at, which means Get them to stop buying it on the street for those that are abusing it in that way and give them a very close prescription. And those other ones that have been on it legitimately with the prescription, continue the prescription until we build that trust. If the patient's buying it on the street, I need to make sure that they are uh, uh, actually telling me uh, and being honest with themselves about the doses that they're taking. So I will see them very regularly, maybe every few days, and continue to refill the prescription that way. And again, this gives me a few opportunities. One, to really get at the root of how much they're using and adjust the dose that I'm giving them. Two, I make sure that they are not abusing my medications and going along with the plan uh, and that's where I need to be so I can get a handle of the milligrams and how often they're taking it. Once I get there with those patients, and once I get there with the patients that are taking a dose that I think is too high that needs to be brought down, I will now attempt to make a cross tolerance. And what does that mean? Simply, if it's something like Xanax, which theoretically has a higher abuse potential, I will switch it over to a longer acting drug and one that gets you uh, gets the rush much uh, more slowly so I have a better chance of a long-term taper. So I might switch to Xanax to Clonopin. If they're highly resistant to this change, I won't do it. But 90% of the time I can make this cross tolerance switch from something like Xanax, which will give you a quick rush versus something that is longer acting and goes in your body slower. This helps me theoretically at the pharmacological level to go ahead and taper on the long run. Once those things are done, A, I have a control over the amount they're using. B, if I can, I make a cross tolerance switch. I've also by this time made a pretty good rapport with the patient and I've built a trust, now I will start the really, really neat part of the way I approach this. What I do is I write them a prescription, whatever it is. Let's say in this case, it's one milligram of clonopin twice a day. And I have the patient come into the office. And again, please remember, there's variations of this depending on where I get to feel the patient is at. So, yeah, and I, and I adjust this accordingly. So I'm just giving you one example of where I might end up on the spectrum. Let's say we have a 
25 year old patient. We've made a good rapport. I've been seeing him for four weeks. I know that we're stable at one milligram of clonopin twice a day. I see them every week for their dose. They're showing up for their appointment. I feel confident there's no other drug use. This is where we're at. And I'm pretty sure that they need to go down to, let's say 0.5 milligrams a day, or we can cut this off completely. I have them bring the medication bottle into the office. And I say, okay, and I draw it out for them. I say, you, you just got 60 of these for the month, correct? And they say, correct. And they're very, 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 very still timid about pulling out the medication, showing it to me. There's this really interesting fear about me taking away the medication and you have to understand that. You have to empathize with that. And I say, tell me when you take these medications. And he's like, well, I take one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And again, please understand I work with any kind of variation of presentations. I'm giving you one example. So he says, I take one in the morning, one in the afternoon. Then I'll say to the patient, please tell me, which dose is the least important dose for you? And he's like, well, my afternoon dose, uh, in the mornings I'm very stressed out and usually in a rush, so uh, I really need that dose, but my afternoon dose, usually I'm home from work and I'm calm and I don't necessarily need it. Once they tell me that, I say, okay, your afternoon dose, here's a whole pill, one in the morning, one milligram, one in the afternoon, one milligram. That's a total of two milligrams a day, and you have two of those per day for 30 days. That's 60 of them. Put two of them out for me, and they put it out. And I say, until your next visit, which I'm not gonna see you for 30 days, I want you to take as many days as you can and cut that afternoon dose in half. Just cut the pill in half. So instead of taking one milligram in the afternoon, I want you to take 0.5 milligrams. And I say, please hold on because they start to get paranoid. I said, please hold on and slow down. You're going to be able to do this either zero days or 30 days. If you do it for 30 days, you're going to be at 1.5 milligrams a day for 30 days. And you're going to have 15 full tablets left. Amazing. If you do it for zero days, you're going to have zero tablets left. Amazing. I don't care which one happens. It's all under, and here's the key, your control. And they almost don't believe you at first. And when you pull this off the first time, the very fact that you've empowered the patient and given them control of this very, very high abuse potential drug that really becomes a fundamental crutch in their psyche for some reason. And they take control and they take over their dosing and succeed even one day, I can tell you the effects for the future of our taper are powerful and amazing. They might do it one day, they might do it three days. You know, I've seen guys chase me in the parking lot. Uh, oh, and so, and then at the end of that, what I do when they show up the next time, they are so excited whether they have one or whether they have five pieces, they feel so invigorated, so empowered. I have to tell them, slow down. Please slow down. Don't start doing uh, cutting down even more. Slow down. And now they see I'm not going to pull them off the drug because there's a method to this madness. I tell them slow down. So I say bring all your pills next time when the first time they show up. Now they're worried I'm going to throw away those half pills, right? Because again, I'm taking something away from them. They're very excited they've accomplished this, but we got a long ways to go. So I take, let's say they pulled it off for three days and they have three half pills left. So that's one and a half milligrams. I take those and I put it back in the pill uh, bottle. And I'm like, here's your new prescription that you also brought. There's only one and a half milligrams from last time. And uh, you can almost see they're trying to protect it because they're, they're afraid I'm gonna take it away and throw it away because they don't know what's gonna happen. And I tell them, now you have a job to do. I don't care if you do it. I want you to take that pill bottle of what's left over. 
and you throw it away when you leave here. Discard them in this way. And I've seen people chase me in the parking lot and they shouldn't be doing this, but they'll throw it away in the garbage outside in the dumpster. They'll be chasing me in a Dr. B, Dr. B. I just threw my uh, old Xanax or Clonopin away. I did it. And I can tell you, this is again, another extremely empowering effect on their addiction. You're basically giving the control to the patient and allowing uh, them to see what's possible. And sometimes you have to actually slow their tapering down. What do I do from here? Again, depending on the patient, what their frequency of use is, what their other issues are, how long they've been using, their age, other problems that they have. And I will continue this taper, if I have to, up to two years because I want the long-term outcome to be successful. And by month three, four, or five, they are really into it. They have built a very deep trust with me. We are cutting down this medication, which is really a harm reduction approach. And once we get towards the tail end, maybe I will decide that they need to be on a low dose of this stuff long-term, which is very few patients. And during this time, if I need to, when they increase their dose or when they have issues, I will go from seeing them once a month to once every two weeks to once a week and continued close monitoring. monitoring. And that is the way my general approach to a benzodiazepine taper is. It's very individualized for the patient. It's extremely safe. It takes away any, and I and you have to understand your doses so they're not withdrawing. And in the beginning, you got to keep a very close eye on them. Uh, we want to make sure they're not having withdrawal symptoms. We want to make sure they don't get sick and have seizures. We want to make sure that they are going to be successful. So every aspect of it is closely monitored by me a lot more early on, and I slightly back off as time goes by. If you enjoyed this video, please go ahead and click on the link above for more videos. Also, don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to the channel. Have a wonderful day.